back. Richard Branson took one giant leap ahead in the billionaire space race this weekend, lifting off to the edge of space in Virgin Galactic's Unity spacecraft. He spent four minutes in zero gravity before returning to Earth, beating Amazon founder Jeff Bezos into space by just a few days. Transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has the latest. Three, two, one, release. This morning, history made. Ignition. Sir Richard Branson blasting off to the edge of space, becoming the first person to launch aboard his own spaceship, floating in weightlessness for four minutes, sending a message back to Earth. To the next generation of dreamers, if we can do this, just imagine what you can do. The history-making moments happening over the New Mexico desert. The mothership Eve carrying Virgin Galactic spaceship Unity to about 50,000 feet. Dropping it, Unity's rocket ignites, blasting Branson and five others to the edge of space. You could hear the roar of the rocket. Um, you're uh, yeah, pinned into your seat. Uh, you're going straight up and you're looking straight up. Uh, you're going from, yeah, sort of naught to 3,000 miles an hour in seven or eight seconds. And, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's a ride of a lifetime. And then you go from that extreme to complete silence. Branson joining us just moments later. We'll be in space! <laughs> excuse us, excuse us. Yeah, got those wings. Fellow astronaut Sarisha Bandla by his side. Only the third Indian American woman to fly to space. Her job, science. I flew up carrying research experiments actually strapped to my leg. So, I mean, this capability is going to transform the research and technology that we can develop in microgravity. Children took center stage in Branson's mind before and after the launch, speaking directly with them. Why is that so important to you? Uh, look, I'm a grandfather, um, I'm a father, and I just love to inspire kids. I mean, as a kid myself, when I saw the moon landing, I was, you know, making rockets out of cardboard boxes. 17 years of work leading Branson to beat Amazon founder Jeff Bezos to space by just nine days, when Bezos is scheduled to board his Blue Origin spacecraft and lift off. Bezos sending him well wishes before the flight, SpaceX founder Elon Musk flying in to send him off in person. If a dyslexic kid like myself and all the wonderful you know, people who've created this can, can do this, then imagine what you can achieve. And every kid can achieve something wonderful in their lives and will do, I'm sure. Such a great message right there. And Virgin Galactic hopes to start flying customers to space by next year. We've told you it's not cheap, about $250,000 per seat. But you know what? About 700 people, Diane, have already signed up. And we should tell you, what about Jeff Bezos? Because he's scheduled to launch in just about eight days. Well, it turns out his company, Blue Origin, doesn't yet have the FAA approval that you need to fly customers to space. So time is ticking and we We'll be watching. Diane? I know you will be. Transportation correspondent Gio Benitez in New Mexico. Gio, thank you. And let's bring in ABC News contributor and former NASA astronaut Katie Coleman, ABC News contributor and former fighter pilot Steve Ganyard, and Nicholas Schmidl, the author of Test Gods, Virgin Galactic, and the Making of a Modern Astronaut. For more on all of this, thank you all for being here today. Katie, I want to start with you. Going to space used to be something reserved for professionals. So what do you think about this evolving industry of space tourism? I'm crazy about it. I mean, it is, uh, I think it means a lot. And I, and I say more people in space, the more ideas we have in space and the more ideas we have down here on the ground. So I'm for it. Nick, you literally wrote the book on Richard Branson and Virgin Galactic. So what was your reaction to the news that this flight was a success? Uh, I mean, it was, it was it's, you know, it's a moment of triumph. And having watched them, you know, I got into the company about three weeks after they had this, suffered this terrible crash in 2014. And so when I walked into the hangar in, in late 2014, uh, the spaceship that you're looking at now was a husk up on scaffolding in the middle of this otherwise empty empty hangar and to have seen and watched that then build this ship build this company and and look I think it's really important to remember that Richard Branson for all of his success he's a master marketer 
Um, he's very good at branding. He doesn't really build things. And so for his real first foray into building something to be spaceships is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a pretty huge achievement. And, and the question has always been all along, was this going to be a cautionary tale or was this going to be a sort of a triumph against all odds sort of story? And I was trying to figure that as I was writing the book and framing all these facts. And you know, at least for this, for for proving that the concept works and that it can deliver him to the edge of space, you know, it, it, it's an against all odds kind of story. He's not lacking in ambition, that's for sure. Uh, and Steve, more countries are getting involved in space exploration. China has a new space station. Israel is trying to land on the moon. What does this all mean for the world? Well, I think what we saw out of Richard Branson yesterday, it's it's fun. Um, but, you know, at, at base, it's actually just uh, it's a fun ride for rich people who can afford two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. And the technology that he used really isn't anything different than what the U.S. was doing in the 1950s and 1960s. That said, it's part of an extraordinary growing ecosystem of commercial space. Uh, it's being led really by Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, but uh, you know, Mr. Branson also has another company called Virgin uh, Orbit, which is going to send small satellites into uh, into space. So. It's this extraordinary growth of commercial aerospace and commercial space that's driving down the cost of launch. To give you an idea, Diane, during the space shuttle, it cost about $25,000 to put one pound into orbit. Now, with the things that Mr. Musk is doing in particular, uh, we're down to about $700. This means those dreams of being able to go to the Mars and to colonize Mars and to, to put people on the moon and use it as a launching pad to other parts of the universe is, is within reach. It's within financial reach. So what we saw yesterday is, is nice. It's fun. Anything that can get people interested in space is good. Uh, but the real story here is what's going on in terms of commercializing space in ways that countries have not been able to do. And Katie, I want to piggyback on that because there's a fair share of critics out there who say, you know, all the money going into this would be better spent trying to solve problems here on Earth. And at least for the immediate future, going to space seems like it's something reserved for the extremely wealthy. So how does this impact those of us who don't have that kind of cash? Yeah, there's there's several approaches there. I mean, the, the thing I really like to start with is that we've heard a lot from Richard Branson about, you know, when I was a child, I dreamed of this and it wasn't true for me. And I grew up in a, in a family where my dad was an explorer because women just didn't see a lot of images of themselves in the media, you know, doing these things. And so, you know, listening to what Steve says, I, I say, why can't we have all of these things? And in terms of the, in, in terms of the different kinds of exploring space, but the fact that this brings so much attention. And then we're seeing different people next week with Jeff Bezos. He's uh, invited Wally Funk to fly with him. One of the women that was tested early um, for can do women have these skills, which of course they do uh, to go to space. And so there's a lot of meaning that you can take, but also the research that we do in, in low earth orbit, much of it cannot be done anywhere else. And it leads to solutions down here on the, on the ground for a range of fields that affect everyone, everything from our health to how we build things and what materials we can have goals for. And so, Nick, really quick, what do you think is the next big goal for Branson and Virgin Galactic? Well, it's it's the big goal, which is is scaling up and, and making this a viable business. And, and that's actually far more difficult than right now what he did yesterday. Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to sort of achieve airline-like frequency and 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 repeatability. And to do that, they know that they really can't afford another accident. And and currently, three the accident the fatality rate for human spaceflight is three percent. If Virgin, if one out of every thirty passengers who gets on a Virgin Galactic ship is killed, that's not going to. They're not going to be able to make a viable business out of that. So they've got to be able to to to, to bring that number down to a fraction of a percent. And that's all the coming weeks, months, years, more, most, most likely years, to see whether they can get this down to weekly, safe weekly flights. And, and you know, I think that's going to be significantly more challenging than even what we saw yesterday. All right. Katie Coleman, Steve Ganyer, Nicholas Schmidl, great to have you guys. Thank you. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.